Good morning. It is good to be here this morning. Good to be back with you. After a week in Mississippi and visiting family there and holding a gospel meeting there in the county that I first started preaching in and getting to see a lot of folks that uh, hadn't seen in a while and getting to visit. Uh, it's good to be back in Leoma this morning. We're going to be in Luke 16 this morning in our continuation of the study of the parables. And before you get crossed with me here, I realize that maybe this is not a parable, okay? Uh, but it's certainly included in a series of parables that Jesus was telling here. I think we don't like it being called a parable for several reasons. Number one, because he didn't say, now let me tell you a parable. But he didn't say that every time with all of them. So it's not like we should just limit the parables to just the ones where Jesus said or where the Bible says, now a parable he spoke unto them. The other reason why I think we have a, a difficulty is because we have, we have real people here. And it's not just this person or that person, if, if the poor beggar was left anonymous, then maybe it would be just like parallel to all other parables in that nobody's really identified. Because normally in a parable, Jesus would say things like, a sower went out, and he doesn't tell anything about, you know, or a man having a hundred sheep, and he doesn't tell us who that man is, or a woman having ten coins, and he doesn't tell us who that woman is, and he begins this parable by saying, or this story, whatever you want to call it, by saying there was a rich man, and that's very vague and very anonymous, but then he says there was a man by the name of Lazarus, and so that's very specific, an identity to an individual that we don't normally get in parables. The other thing is that the story, this parable, some have suggested that if you just call it a parable, then you, I don't know really what you can't do at that point. Because it's like as if to say, well now it's a parable and therefore it's not true and therefore, wait a minute, parables are true. You know, they want to come in and say, well now, well now, if this is just a parable, then we can't make application. Why not? We make application with every other parable, don't we? So why can we not make application with this parable? As a matter of fact, it's by definition, a parable is an earthly story with a spiritual meaning or implication. And this one certainly is an earthly story with huge spiritual implications or applications as we seek to make them. And so I, I'm just not, I guess I'm just not accepting the debate of whether this is a real story or not. Here's what I know. It's in your Bible. God meant for you to read it, and He meant for you to learn something from it. Now, whether it really happened or not, who cares? Whether, whether Lazarus is, in fact, some poor beggar that is an actual man that they could put their hands on or not, what difference does it make? It doesn't change the story, does it? It doesn't change the, the meaning, does it? It doesn't change the lessons that, that you and I are to glean from it. And I would say, by and large, all of us could probably tell exactly how this story unfolds in Luke 16, beginning in verse 19. I want us to do a couple of things this morning. First thing I want us to do is, I want us to contrast these two men. I want us to really see the contrast between their lives before the event and their lives after the event. I want us to look at the contrast and notice, notice the change and notice how the coin flips in the contrast 
as it relates to where they are on what particular side of the event. I want us to identify the event. The event changes everything. The event is the catalyst for the story. What is the event? And then I want us to close by thinking about the gulf. The gulf. I was scrolling through Facebook last night and there's a lot of people at the gulf, right? Right now, enjoying the gulf. And I looked at those pictures and behind a lot of those people, you know, is that is that ocean. If that helps you any to think about the gulf that we're talking about, perhaps in similar ways, there could be some parallels made there to the separation of the gulf. And ultimately what I want us to do is to think about the gulf now, not then. It's imperative that we understand the reality of the gulf now. Because then it'll be easy. Now it's a little more challenging. Because it is by faith, and it is because of God's amazing grace. You realize that in Luke 16, of all the other stuff that we get caught up in, there he is as the story un folds or as it ends, there is a ministry of reconciliation. What I want us to do is I want us to understand the power that is in the ministry of reconciliation, that God is using us to reconcile people to Him through the cross of Christ. You hear 2 Corinthians 5? That today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to recognize the significance of the gulf because there's an event coming. It's the same event that takes place in Luke chapter 16. There was a rich man, look at verse 19. He was clothed in purple and fine linen. He feasted sumptuously every day. He lived in luxury every day. If I were to, to, to draw a chart out here or, or to make some, some columns and, and, and to, to put this contrast on a bed sheet and to preach this in a chart form, you got the first block or the first square or the first column is the rich man before the event. He's a man that is dressed in purple and fine clothing. He's a man that is feasting and, and living luxuriously every day. He has a pretty impressive gate apparently out in front of his house. I don't know much else about his house, but I would suggest to you that it's, it's a very nice place to live. He's probably got servants bringing him the food that he's partaking of and, and, and ironing the clothes that he's wearing and laying them out on the bed for him and all, all of these luxurious type things as he's living here before the event. The beggar, verse 20, the poor man lays at his gate and his name is Lazarus. And he's covered with sores. And he desires to be fed with just the crumbs that would fall from the rich man's table. Jesus even gives us this little description here at the end of verse 21 there. The dogs come and lick his sores. So by contrast to the man that is, that is finally clothed and, and sitting at the banquet table and feasting very luxuriously, very sumptuously. On the other side of the contrast, we've got a poor beggar. 
who is no doubt, malnourished who is no doubt, unhealthy who apparently has some type of, of skin balls going on externally, and he's, and he's laying at the gate and, and he's, he's not asking for a meal. He's asking for the crumbs. He's just hoping to get the leftovers. Just the, 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 what's left on the plate of the people that they don't eat. Not even the leftovers per se. But just what's about to be thrown out in the trash or scraped off in the garbage. I think about that in our culture, in our society today, and maybe you do this and maybe you don't, but I know some people that they, they'll take their plates and they'll scrape them off into a bucket and they'll, they'll take that out to the dog, or they'll put all the plates together and they'll, and they'll take that one plate of scraps, as we would call them, and they'll take that out to the backyard and dump it for, for the critters or the animals out there. I think about the parallel to the fact that here are the dogs coming to lick his sores and here is a man who's just wanting what we would feed to the animals. And I look at that contrast between the two before the event. Well, you know what the event is, right? Takes place in verse 22. It's death. That's the event. So the contrast on this side of the event, that is death, now as we fast forward to the other side of the event, what does it look like now? Verse 22 tells us Lazarus died, was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. There's the event. It's an event that we don't like. It's an event that we don't enjoy. It's an event that, that we've had to suffer through a lot here recently in this congregation. Many, many families affected by, by this event. It's been an event that's been going on for ever since the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's been an event that, that has pulled away family members, that has caused separation, that has caused depression, that has caused anxiety. It's been an event that has created terrible situations within families. It's caused heartache and disappointment within children. The list could just go on and on. Everything from tragedy, untimely, unexpected, to long-term illness, old age, fading of the human body. It's an event that we've all had to deal with. It's an event that we will all have to continue to deal with. As much as we don't like it, as much as we don't enjoy it, the reality of it is always there before us. The rich man and the poor man both die. Do you notice the parallel in their death? They both die. How, how did they die? We don't, we don't know. The point is, they both breathe their last breath. Now notice as the contrast begins to unfold after the event, Abraham's bosom was the location of the poor man. Carried by angels to that location, the rich man was buried. As you think about Life after the event for the rich man. Notice what verse 23 says. Being in torments. Plural. Being in multiple tormenting situations. Being in 
in pain and in agony and in suffering from torment from all types of angles and everything imaginable. He lifted up his eyes and he sees Abraham afar off. And he also sees Lazarus. And seeing Lazarus, verse 24, he calls out to Abraham and he requests just the tip of his finger, that is Lazarus' finger, to be in water, to be dropped on his tongue so that he might be cooled off just momentarily from the anguish of the flame, of the fire. Here's a man who is in torment. He's in torments of all types. He is having to endure a flame that is so hot that he believes just the drop, not a drink, not a sip, just a drop of cold water would be so refreshing, would be so soothing to him. And that's his request. But Abraham says in verse 25, remember in your lifetime you received good things. Now here's here's the difference. We go from a man in verse 19 who is living in purple and fine linen, who is feasting sumptuously, who is living luxuriously every day of his life, to now we have a man on the other side of the event is tormented. He's asking for a drop of cool water. He's being told by Abraham, you had your good things. In life, you had the good things that you got to enjoy. Lazarus, or the poor man, on the other hand, apparently in Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side implied as a place of rest, implied as a place of friendship, implied as a place of of peace, of comfort. If not so much implied, look down in verse 25. Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted. So you go back to the before the event, and there laid a poor man, a beggar seeking the crumbs off the plate at the gate with sores all over him, so much so that the dogs came. And now on this side of the event, he's in a place of rest. He's in a place of comfort. He's in a place of peace. All the while, verse 25, the rich man is in a place of anguish. He's in a place of torment. Verse 26. And besides all this, besides the fact that that we've got this contrast going on here, and besides the fact that that rich man, you got your, your good things in life, and you lived how you wanted to live, and you did as you wanted to do, and And then the event come and now look at you. And besides the fact that that Lazarus lived a terrible, miserable, pathetic life by, by worldly standards and by human measurements, but he went through the event and now on that side of the event, he is exactly where everybody would want to be. Besides all of that, Rich man, Abraham says in verse 26, between you and me there is a great gulf or a great chasm. There's a great divider. There's a, there's a great boundary here of sorts such that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may come from there to us. And this great gulf has been fixed. This great gulf is permanent. This great gulf is the reality 
of eternity. We oftentimes say, and even our songs, where will, where will you spend eternity? You're not going to spend nothing. You see, I've been, I've been traveling lately, and so money's been going out of my wallet as quick as it's been coming in, it feels like. You're spending money, right? You understand that concept. And eventually, if you keep spending, guess what? You'll look in it, and there won't, it'll be gone. There won't be nothing there. You will have spent it all. It's that mentality then that oftentimes plagues us when we come to eternity. Where will you spend eternity as if it's something you can run out of? You're not going to run out of it. Where will you live in eternity? Where will you dwell in eternity? Where will you abide in eternity? Maybe those would be better words to help us to conceive the idea that, that this is a permanent fixed gulf. Now, I, I do believe that this is the realm of Hades and I don't believe it's heaven or hell and I do believe that judgment is coming and I do believe that whoever this rich man is and whoever Lazarus was, they will stand before God on judgment day and there will be a permanent dwelling place called heaven and hell at that point. You'll come back tonight, I'll expand on that a little bit more along with some other modern beliefs that I believe are destroyed by this story. There's a lot of false doctrines being taught that this one story right here could help us to refute if we just stop and think about it a little bit. While I'm not confident at all that these men are in heaven and hell, what I am confident of is that they are fixed in a dividing place with a gulf in the middle. There is no passing from one to the other. The event has occurred. And once the event occurs, right, it is appointed unto man once to die. Man will give an account for the things that he has done in the body before the event. Because once the event of death takes place, and everything is fixed, everything is permanent, there is a great divide where there, there will be no passing from one to the other. And it is imperative that we understand the reality of the gulf now as opposed to waiting like the rich man did till then. When he recognizes this gulf in verse 26, having it pointed out by Abraham, you'll remember what he does, right? He begins to engage in the ministry of reconciliation. He begins to beg. He begins to plead. He begins to request that someone would help those brothers of his because he realizes he's on the other side of the event. But his brothers are not. They still have opportunity. There's still a chance. There's still hope for them. Abraham sent Lazarus back that he might engage in the ministry of reconciliation with the cross of Christ. Telling people about salvation and the desire of God to save mankind because of His amazing grace. Abraham says, they've got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. There's a, there's, there's a desire, obviously, putting yourself... In the, in the time frame of Luke 16, Jesus living on the earth hasn't died on the cross yet. They've got the Old Testament. They've got Moses. They've got the law. They've got the prophets. They, they understand. They can understand. They have the writings to know what it is that God wants. 2 Corinthians 5. 
past or beyond the cross now. Paul says we are ambassadors for Christ. Engaged in the ministry of reconciliation. Why? Because we want to help as many people as we can before the event. Why? Because we know that after the event, there is fixed a great gulf. And there will be no passing to or from at that point. Parable or story, I don't care. Truth, all through it. You and I are on a collision course with the event. And where we stand at the moment of the event will determine where we exist in eternity. On which side of the gulf do you find yourself? With the rich man or with Lazarus? If not with Lazarus, I beg and I plead and I implore today, now is the time of salvation. Would you receive what God is offering as we stand and sing?